A warning before we begin. This podcast is explicit in every way. So do y'all hang out offset or did y'all yeah. during during uh film? She did she, oh, yeah. she so like oh, yeah. give us some stories. Give so us some I remember stories, I remember when we were getting ready to film. I remember when we got kicked out of eleven because we was fighting the racist woman in the bathroom. That's Chameleon <laughs> and Aida Osman, the lead actors on the HBO show Rap Shit. And on our Zoom call, Aida's reliving the night that solidified her friendship with her on-screen co-star. Millie came to the club with her lawyers. Who does that? That's <laughs> hilarious already. It's me, Chameleon, and two older white men just having a blast that night, oh like just God. running around the streets of Miami. The four of them were getting turned at the same club Aida and Chameleon had just been filming the show at a few days earlier and were set to film at again. You could say they were getting ratchet for the sake of research. Aida stepped away for a second to go to the bathroom, and apparently the club staff had a problem with that. I'm trying to use one of the bathrooms, and they're like, this is for this is for the employees, ma'am. You can't pee here. But I'm already in the stall peeing, so that's crazy. And she made me mad because she walked in on my girl peeing. I'm like, bitch, what, what is you doing? I'm calling the cops. Get out. You're going to jail. I'm like, girl, you call here. whoever you want to call. And... As soon as we walked out the bathroom, <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> she called, they had she us surrounded. Since the club staff called their backup, Chameleon called hers. I called my lawyer. So I'm like, hey, yo, um, we over here. They trying to take us. They trying to kick us out of here. Like, we stars. We I don't know what's going on. I feel like they're, they're like, what do you call it? Um, racially profiling us because, you know, it wasn't a lot of black mm -hmm. people in the club that night. He shuffles down from the section because he was in a section with her Oh, lawyers. my God. And he comes and he intervenes and he helps us out. But in that moment, I shut down. I remember being like, I'm so scared right now. Like, what's going on? <laughs> Millie is yelling, defending my honor. In the midst of it all, I felt so warm. <laughs> I was like, They're like, do y'all want to come back in the club? I'm like, nah, we don't want to be here no more. You know how much money yeah. HBO just paid for us to film here? <laughs> come on, get out of here. Yeah. We are Issa Rae's daughters. <laughs> you can racially profile me. Hello? Do you know who I, do you know who I work for? The reason Aida's calling themselves Issa Rae's daughters is because Issa Rae is the creator of rap shit. The comedy is based loosely on city girls, and it's all about two Miami rappers who form an unlikely pair and find more success together than they would apart. This imagining of two women in rap collaborating goes against one of the oldest rules in hip-hop. There can only be one queen bitch. That's why the girls be arguing all the time. Aida remembers this coming up a lot in the writers' room. We were thinking a lot about how there was only room for like one pop rap woman until about post Nicki Minaj. And there was like an era in the 90s where it didn't feel that way necessarily. Like there was the Lil' Kim era and she was clearly on top, but there was other women from different sides of the country representing what it looked like and reflecting what it looked like to be from Miami, to be from Philly, to be from Houston or wherever they were from. And then like, if you liked La Chat, you liked La Chat. If you liked Trina, you liked Trina. Like there was corners for everywhere to go, for everyone to go. And then Nicki Minaj came through and was like the only one. And that's all we got. And every single song on the radio from like 2010 to 20, 17 was a Nicki Minaj song. Don't worry about me and who I do. Aida even caught herself sipping the Kool Aid. And then Cardi B came out of nowhere. Say, little bitch, you can fuck with me if you wanted to. These expensive, these is red bottoms, these is bloody shoes. I was in college, I remember it was all over the place, and I remember thinking consciously and catching myself going, well damn, Nicki Minaj's career is over. Mm. And being like, bitch, why the fuck do we gotta be like that? But that's what we're thinking, because that's how we're programmed. I'm Sydney Madden. I'm Rodney Carmichael. And from NPR Music, this is Louder Than a Riot, where we confront the double standard that's become the standard. In each of the last nine episodes, We've been tackling an unwritten rule of rap that affects the most marginalized among us and holds the entire culture back. But on this episode, we're digging into the mother of all those rules, the scarcity mindset. The belief that access and resources are so limited that you gotta fight tooth and nail for them, and that only one can make it to the top at a time. The scarcity mindset is what enforces all the other rules. 
It's what conditions rappers to believe they need to act a certain way, look a certain way, rap a certain way, put up with harassment, alienation, and erasure. So for our last episode of the season, we break down the scarcity mindset, how it's endured for so long, and how it's being challenged now more than ever. And as a goodbye, we face the scarcity happening to us as a podcast in the world of hip-hop media right now. Rule number 10, watch the queen conquer. All right, Sid, I don't know if you remember one of these early pitch meetings we had when we were first starting to throw all our ideas at the wall about what we wanted this season to be and what we wanted to cover. You had this one thing that you stuck to and said it was essential that we got into this season. And that theme was scarcity. Mm. And I remember when you said it, I was like, okay, because it's one of those terms that I'm only really used to hearing in economic terms. And so I was really curious, like, what was going through your head when you pitched it? I mean, it's just always been there, you know? Mm. It's one of those hip-hop commandments that I feel like goes unnamed the most. It's everywhere. It's omnipresent in the culture. But because it goes unnamed, it's able to go unchecked. But if you really start looking for it, you can see it pop up and be the deeper motivation behind a lot of specific, you know, conflicts that play out in hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. As we were reporting on our stories this season, it became clear that scarcity underpinned a lot of scenarios we were covering. Like when Sha was made to feel like she had to pick between being a mom or being an MC by her own crew. Or when Dream felt she had to get a BBL to get noticed in the industry. Or when McConan got deserted by hip-hop because of his own male expression. Exactly. Right. Scarcity functions in a way that reinforces all the other rules. All season long, we've been tracking it through 50 years of hip-hop, and you can see it's been there from the start. Yeah, I mean, it definitely goes back to the foundations. And one of the earliest folks that you talked to talked about exactly that. The funny thing is I think two women can always find a common ground. I think it's the testosterone and the ego of the men to make women feel like you got to be the only one. You the only one on top. That's the legendary MC Light, who started her career alongside the duo Audio 2. And she felt the squeeze of the scarcity mindset all the way back in 1988. We're driving, we're on the highway, headed back to New York City. It's late. It's during the Mr. Magic Molly Mall hour, which I think was somewhere between 9 to 12. They heard a sample of their track top villain being played on the radio with another group's raps on it. A woman on the track named Antoinette was coming at them. You want to know why I play you like that? I don't like your face. She was dissing guys, and she said something about your bodyguard, whatever. At least that's what they thought they heard. Audio 2 took offense immediately. And they hear the record, and they just go bananas in terms of, what are we going to do? This is some BS, blah, blah, blah. And then they all looked at me and was like, it's a girl, you got to diss her. And I was like, all right. I was young, you know, like, girl, tell me there's a fight and I'm coming, I'm showing up. (laughs) And so we went straight into the studio, INS studio on Mary Street, downtown Manhattan. And we stayed in overnight and came out with 10% this. Hot damn ho, here we go again. Suck a steal a beat when you know they can't win. You stole the beat. Are you having fun now? Ten percent diss gave MC Light a stamp. It got a name moving in them streets too, but it wasn't even MC Light's fight. What is their knee-jerk reaction saying? Oh, it's a girl. You gotta diss her. You gotta answer her back. What does that say about misogyny? 
Well, for me, what it said is that they wanted to use me to diss her because ego. Be fighter, don't stop, take her. Tell you to your face, you ain't nothing but a faker. You know, they felt like she was coming right at them, yet they couldn't be seen as monsters to diss her themselves. So they had to put it on my shoulder. Putting that on light shoulders was pitting the two MCs against each other instead of allowing them to focus on their own craft. And who's that fighting really for? Conflict between women leads men to envision Turkish oil wrestling. Men don't want to watch an argument. Men want to watch them wrestle. Mm -hmm. And in hip hop, it became like that kind of a sport for men to watch, to watch Mm -hmm. women fight each other. That's Kathy Handley, a music journalist, professor, and author of God Save the Queens. The essential history of women in hip hop. The thing that's always said is like, you know, competition is the main driver of the culture. So what would you say is the is the difference between healthy competition and, and scarcity? I think hip hop is a sport only to those who identify as athletes. For <laughs> others, it's an art. For those who identify as artists. Mm-hmm. So sometimes what would happen is you were trying to put artists onto a field to play ball. Mm. And some of those artists just weren't down for that. And likewise, you have seasoned athletes who didn't really participate in the art. Mm. So they made it interesting by just going at each other. And women live somewhere in the middle of that. Mm. There are women who were highly artistic, who had no desire to compete with anyone. But here they are putting them on the court and in the field trying to get them to go against each other. And they're like, how did I get here? I I had a poetry background (laughs) or I was singing in church. Why are you putting me toe to toe against another woman when there's so few of us to begin with? So let's go back to the roots of scarcity and break down the math of it all. If the fragility of the male ego means men won't go toe to toe with women, That means women can only really battle each other. Now call it chivalry or straight up misogyny, but the outcome's the same. Women MCs aren't treated as equals in the game. And let's add a layer to that, Rodney. If women are only fighting each other and there's so few of them, what happens? A reputation starts to form. They're catty, they can't work together. You gotta keep them separate. And I think that what started to happen was they started to use the the phrase first lady and Mm. that became a limiting title Mm -hmm. because nobody wanted to be the second lady. Mm -hmm. So being crowned first lady usually meant you were the only lady. Less of a compliment than a way to condition women MCs to fight over scraps rather than fighting the men who are making the opportunity so scarce. Yeah, we've seen it play out way too many times. Look, Kim... First Lady of Junior Mafia. Foxy Brown, First Lady of the Firm. Amil, the First Lady of Rockefeller. Eve, the First Lady of Rough Riders. Gangsta Boo, the First Lady of 3 Six Mafia. Mia X, the First Lady of No Limit. It goes on and on and on. Every crew followed the formula. The First Lady title put rappers on a pedestal. A pedestal with a trap door. After 97, it was like full speed ahead. Mm. Mm. But where that came to a halt is in 1999 with the advent of Napster. Mm. And as soon as the labels were taking a financial hit, you weren't able to figure out who it was that you were going to put your money behind. So now who becomes the casualty? Women. So now it's like, okay, well, we would rather make sure Jay-Z's records come out because, Foxy, you're too expensive. And why is Foxy too expensive? Oh, well, hair, makeup. Or Trina, you're too expensive. Hair, makeup. You know, you require a bigger stage presence. Why? Men can rap in sweatpants. And I think, like, again, that's where they furthered that scarcity model. Then it becomes financial scarcity. 
Mm-hmm. Well, how, how much are we willing to budget for one woman? Because we're not going to pay for two. So, sorry, Lady Luck. Foxy Brown has to go on tour. This fed into the idea that women in rap were expendable, not a necessary part of the equation, not foundational to the culture, but accessories, window dressing. And when times got tight, they were the first to go. In 2010... Ava DuVernay tracked the shrinkage of the female MC with her documentary, My Mic Sounds Nice. So if the 80s had, you know, a handful of folks kind of starting the history, the 90s exploded. But then, interestingly, in the new decade, in the 2000s, it went back down. You know, so we went from 40 female MCs who were really getting shine to back down to 10, 12 again. And it was, it was slim pickings. It was hard to find, you know, a female MC of any worth who had the support of a major record label. And according to the doc, by 2010, there were only three women rappers signed to major labels. This reduction took us from an era of many queens to just one. Pull up in a monster automobile gangster with a bad bitch that came from Sri Lanka. Yeah, I'm in a tanka, color a Willy Wonka. You could be the king, but watch the queen conquer. Now, there was a lot going on during the Nicki Minaj come up, and I don't want to ever pretend it was simple. There's so much noise surrounding Nicki's rise at this point that it's almost hard to remember what the industry was like without her. Yeah, Nikki's emergence wasn't due to just being the only player on the field. She had to stand on the shoulders of the biggest men in the game, go toe-to-toe with them, and be twice as good. Nikki ran from, let's say, 2010 to 2017, going on world tours, dropping billboard chart toppers, and accomplishing a really successful pop crossover. But because she was the only one who was being pushed on a large scale like that, elevated to the highest heights that rap could reach, her success, if anything, only made the drought more obvious. And being the queen means you either reign supreme or get conquered. Because the throne only fits one. Yeah, Cardi B, I'm back, bitches. I want to hear I'm acting different. Same lips that be talking about me is the same lips that be asking. For the last several weeks, rumors have swirled regarding a potential feud between the two female MCs in the wake of Cardi's meteoric rise this summer. I don't really want problems with anybody. I don't want to I don't want to be like queen. I don't want to be no this. I don't want to be no that. I just want to make music and make money. Like, I, I really don't. The origins of the beef are a little murky. Some point to Nicki name dropping Cardi's now husband on Katy Perry's Swish Swish in 2017. The only thing with Cardi that really, really, really hurt my feelings was the first interview she did after Motorsport came out. I remember, like, when I first came in the game, um, if a female of that stature had done a feature with me on it, I would only be, you know, singing their praises and uh, and, and saying thank you. You don't want smoke with me, this is a lace blunt. Raps Jackie Chan, we ain't pulling them fake stunts. My crown won't fit on your bum ass lace front. People have been wanting them to be in a feud since Cardi came out almost yep. a year ago. Yeah. And they've kind of stayed away from it and gone above it, but now it just seems like they're playing into the narrative that everyone... Do you hashtag Nikki Day, hashtag Chun Li. Woo, y'all, this is too much tea for me. My cup runneth over, okay? This is a mess. Instead of acknowledging that Nikki was walking down a road that was laid before her and built that road up. Here comes Cardi. Instead of acknowledging that Cardi is an extension of that road, what do they call her? A replacement for Nikki. And once again, the cycle continues of saying there could only be one. What started out as a little unserious drama soon became a full-on beef between two of the biggest rappers in the game. And after a real-life fight at a fashion week party, the division only got deeper. To some people, it must have almost felt inevitable. The scarcity math was mathing. The equation had been internalized by the culture, and change did not feel like it would come. Until around 2019, when something shifted. It's really like a lot of the fans. Like, they really make it seem like True. You, you're picking sides. Like, but I really, really, really like both of them. That's Meg the Stallion talking to E! News right around the start of Hot Girl Summer. You know, in 2019. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're two different people, two different rappers. Like, it's not even the same. So, like, I feel like we need to stop trying to compare them. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But, like, I love both of them. So, I would definitely like to collab with Cardi, too. Cardi or Nicki? That's the question that every rising woman in rap was getting hit with. But that summer, 
would mark what some have called a renaissance of women in rap. The same renaissance that we've been analyzing all season. And Meg and the other rappers entering the scene, they were questioning the questions. Like, why does there have to be only one queen? By having Meg be able to collaborate with Nicki and Cardi, and, and, you know, saying with her whole chest that I'm not going to pick a side, you're really saying something, especially at that point with Meg being, the, like, one of the top artists. If we have to talk about who, if we're, if we're crowning hip hop uh, prom king and queen, yeah, <laughs> Meg's the prom queen, right? But Megan, much like Katie Heron in Mean Girls, broke up her tiara and she's handing it off to everybody. I think we're definitely in an era of defying that scarcity model because women now are able to look at the past and know now to not let history repeat itself. And I think that they have the foresight now of watching those things happen and and looking and saying, like, let's not repeat that. There can be more than one girl from different walks of life that represent totally different things, you know? There's a voice for everybody now, and that's what I love. On top of portraying a rapper on HBO's rap shit, Chameleon is one in real life. And as the crown has been broken up these last couple of years, she's seen how it's changing the game. I feel like, you know, there's just, there's more, there's more spaces for you to be yourself and to be accepted and go triple platinum and do the same type of yes. numbers that Nikki did. And you don't have to be Nikki, mm-hmm. you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you can like see yourself reflected too. I remember going down Camille's Instagram and she had like, a machine gun and she was on an ATV and then in the next one she was like and we taking money from these niggas and we making our own money and I was like all of these multitudes in one person is crazy <laughs> we've never seen that we exist in we multitudes have... yep. period Chameleon's range on her IG represents how wide the space is right now as fans in this era of hip hop we love to know that Meg's obsessed with anime or that Rico Nasty gets a kick out of putting her kids lunch together or that Flo Millie can't stop binging early 2000s reality TV. Artists are very online and taking control of their own narratives, revealing layers of themselves beyond the glossy magazine covers and label promo. Their values, their flaws, their humanity comes through a whole lot more. And it's harder to make artists a footnote when they're the main character. That was so inspiring for me as like, a young Nebraskan woman who was like trying to figure out my sexuality, but I want to wear Carhartt every day, but I also want to be decked out in a rollie, but I also volunteer. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's so many things that we are and we can be. And it was, it was just so important for me to see her. And that reminds me how important it is to see every single type of woman in rap. Chica, BK the Ruler, Rico Nasty, um, Ice Spice, come yeah. on. It's mm-hmm. girls in the Bronx that need that. Yeah. It's, they, it, they still need that. It's some girl like, yeah, I love that. That's me. But that same range caused their on-screen characters to butt heads in the beginning. The way Aida's character, Shauna, sees it, you're either rapping about structural inequality or reinforcing it. But Chameleon's character, Mia, sees things differently. I really want niggas to think... Girl, if a nigga want an NPR, they go get NPR. I'm not about to play dress up for niggas on the internet. Girl, you wear a mask. That's different. My art is not for the male gaze. Girl, what the gay niggas got to do with it? No, like, male gaze, like, patriarchy shit. Niggas be watching what we do. I don't get it. What's so wrong with having niggas looking at you? Mia and Shauna's collaboration on rap shit, it might be fictional, but the way they cut through rap's binary thinking on how women have to be, it's part of the same shift we're seeing in the real world. You were right. Period. You feel empowered. I feel empowered. Yeah. I feel like a bad bitch. So now we're gonna do your verse. Okay, I wanna say something like this. Classy, I'm a real bitch, but I'm nasty. Ride the dick good, then I ask what a cash be. Ashley, yeah, I got bang. And do you think I give a fuck what you think? Girl, like it. You're so good. I'm dead. I'm weak. I'm dead. Okay, let's run it back. Okay. my name in it. Go insane in it. On screen, Aida and Chameleon are reshaping old, crusty narratives and chipping away at the scarcity that underpins all the rules holding the entire culture back. And off screen, artists are not waiting for the culture to play catch up. 
click, click, pal, where your guns at? Shit, yeah, really had to do it, bitch, bump that. I'm the queen of the shit, bitch, fuck that, bitch, I'm on top now. I'm going to do my own thing and do it how, how I know how to do it. And if y'all don't like it, then that's y'all problem. Um, and I think I come off like that, too, with, like, lyrically in my, in my music and stuff like that. Like, I say what I want to say, I do what I want to do, and... That's that. Bronx rapper Quay Dash is a black trans woman who makes boom bap and hyper pop mesh on her tracks while defying all types of hip hop norms. Whether it's on a Versace runway or on an episode of HBO's Euphoria, Quay's voice has been heard in some major pop culture moments. But you might not even know you heard her, because she's part of rap's queer foundation that's been sidelined for way too long. And that's because of another variable in the scarcity equation. I would hear albums like being in a group home growing up, hearing like, like other like guys that was in the group home because I grew up in an all male you know group home. Um, I would hear like guys listening to like Eminem and like uh, like G Unit, you know Fifty Cent, all of that like Cameron Dipset. So I, I that's when I knew it was like misogyny was real. Then I'll just be like, damn, like I don't want to listen to this. And like one of the staff members, she had bought me a uh, a little Kim cassette. And it was uh, the hardcore, the hardcore album. It was definitely like, you know, some real like shit that I've never heard in my life, you know. And um, that's when I just started like listening more to female rap because it, it just felt more empowering to hear like a woman, you know, say what's really going on out here than to have like these men just like put them down and make them feel like, you know, terrible. Growing up in group homes, and at some points not having a home, Quay experienced extreme scarcity in real life. Stability was scarce. Safety was scarce. And she never wanted to replicate that feeling in her music. Her raps were an escape that provided abundance. Like all the negativity that was going on in my life, I was just trying to find a a way out. I would just like start writing mad different, like, uh, you know, raps and stuff like that. And it, it started to be ongoing, so mm-hmm. it, it it just never stopped for me. You know, I always just made sure I had some good bars and some good some good lyrics and stuff like that written down somewhere. So for the future, um, if it came down to be me to be a rapper, I'll be set. <laughs> so yeah. So you stay ready, so you didn't have to get ready. Basically. Yeah, basically, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The CEO, the head honcho, roaming around and smacking bitches in the poncho. These ratchet bitches think they they cute, but they not though. I'm about to change up the game and make it pronto. She carved out a space within New York's underground scene, then cut to the chase with the release of Transphobic, her debut EP. These niggas is pussy, they so flag vagina, rocking rainbow like this shit was designer. I don't really want to talk about men on my songs unless I'm talking shit. I really don't want to talk about like sex with men and like I don't want to talk about that. And I know that's what people want to hear, but I don't want to talk about that. I just feel like I'm better off doing what I've been doing. I'm more of a 90s boom bap, real bitch vibe, real shit, real shit. Quay named her project transphobic not only to call out transphobia in hip hop, but also to call out the erasure of trans identities in it overall. I come through in a vintage outfit, makeup and hair done, jeans and blouse shit. Correct the chick quick if she try and doubt shit. I'm a home wrecker, I'll fuck this stuff, bitch. With tracks like Decline Him and Queen of NY, Quay established herself in what she calls her boss bitch lane, providing bars that uplifted her community, one that's routinely disempowered. And it caught on fast. Quay knew exactly what she wanted her music to do and who it was for. But when labels came calling, they had a different idea. They weren't trying to change anything about me, bro, like how I'm... how I should look or anything like that. It was more... They were trying to change my sound... They were trying to switch me into the more dancey kind of music. Mm-hmm. And I was like, eh, I can do it. I, I sound good on that kind of stuff, but 
I didn't want to be in the same lane as other female artists that might be in the same, you know, category uh, or genre as me. I didn't want to sound like those girls. I didn't want to be like them. I, I wanted to have, like, my own, you know, sound and make sure that it was hip-hop. I don't know. I mean, we can speculate, but do you think they they were trying to push it more there because of of the transphobia that exists in hip hop and the, how like more welcoming the dance community can be, like yeah, in terms I of marketability? What, yeah, it's, that's that's basically what it was, and I wasn't really like I didn't have a problem with it, but I was just like in my mind, I was like, girl, that deal didn't end up going through. I can do this independently and do whatever I want to do without having somebody on my back trying to change anything about me. So um, I went with that route and I stuck with it. I mean, let's keep it a buck. The hip-hop industry has never really supported black trans artists. Like Quay, they're often forced to pursue an independent route. Quay is currently signed to an indie label out of the UK called Super Nature Limited, where she retains all the rights to her music. And while that's dope, independence for a trans rapper doesn't equal the access she'd need to combat scarcity on a major level. So as of now, Quay's directing her focus on different goals. After taking a break from music, her new material is a shift in her vision. This one is probably just going to be more focused on, like, uh, cutting-edge, edgier, like, sounds, you know what I'm saying? More on the electronic side, you know what I'm saying? But it's still going to be rough. It's still going to be hip-hop. It's still going to be rap because I'm on it. I think it's going to be more of, like, focused on, like, maybe one genre, I think. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I'll change my mind. (laughs) Maybe I'll change my mind. But, yeah, there's definitely some new music. I'm taking everything day by day and taking my time because you don't got to put out stuff you know, all fast and, and rapid. Like, you, you got to take your time with these things. Meg's ignoring the tactics of scarcity. Quay's taking hold of her career in spite of it. And Aida and Millie, they're playing with the possibilities of a world without it. That's what makes this Renaissance period so different than any other one in rap's history. But while this time is super inspiring, it's also fragile. If a renaissance is a rebirth of social change, eventually that infancy ends. And when it does, people either get tired of pushing for change and revert back to the status quo, or we accept something different as the new norm. But new norms are a direct threat to the old ways of doing business. And under capitalism, one thing the business is not gonna do is put itself at risk. So the key to making this renaissance more than a moment is collectively rejecting the idea that there can only be one. From execs and artists to media and stands and everybody in between. Because otherwise, scarcity threatens our momentum and keeps us all playing by the same unspoken rules that we've been breaking down all season long. Mm Mm-hmm. And Rodney, you know, we know what facing down scarcity feels like all too well. Mm. Because Louder's been dealing with that same innate pressure from the jump. No doubt. All right, y'all, we've come to the final act of the final episode of our season. And you may or may not know, this is the end of the road for Louder Than a Riot, at least for now. As part of the 10% company-wide layoffs at NPR, Louder Than a Riot was discontinued and our team was laid off. So, for the last word, we needed to get everybody on a call one more time. First up, we got the senior producer, Gabby Bogarelli. Hey, Sid. Hey. We got producer Sam J. Leeds. Don't forget the J. Oh, never. Never that. We got Mano Nobel Sundaraisen. What's up, y'all? Ew. And our editor, Soraya Shockley. Hey. What's going on? And of course, we got Rodney on the line. What's up, Sid? So, yeah, 
here we are. And as y'all know, this, this whole episode has been about scarcity. Really, this whole season has been about scarcity in the industry mm-hmm. and the artists that we've highlighted, how they faced it, how they've challenged it and pushed back against it. And lo and behold, here we are. Scarcity has come for us, our own team. <laughs> Rodney, why are you giving me preacher man right now? I mean, that's my no, vibe. I, Which one? I actually love it though. I yeah. actually love okay, it. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> Marley's like, and here we are. <laughs> Scarcity in our own Scammer. home. <laughs> I mean, what can we say? From the beginning. We definitely set out to do something different. Rodney, I remember when you and I would talk about it after hours at NPR, just, you know, sitting back from your desk at the end of the day. We always had the ambition to wade in the waters of something deeper, like complicate these stories, show where hip hop has been a mirror to society and called out the carceral state and the inherent racism of it. And then when we did that in season one, we didn't want to keep that same track going into season two because we weren't trying to replicate the perceived criminality. A lot of the stories we told over the course of the entire series, season one and season two, were stories that some people would prefer be left untold because at the core they interrogate power imbalances that allow hip-hop to run as usual. What we really set out to do was interrogate those power imbalances in hopes of starting conversations that will eradicate those imbalances. Cultural conversations that will usher in a cultural change. Period. (laughs) Period, poo. And we made custom scents with Saucy Santana. (laughs) I know that's right. I'd be smelling rich. I think also I just want to call out how how inspired I am by everybody on this team and also how much I admire that we we're committed to this work, not just in the telling of these stories and the making of this show, but also in the way that we live our lives um, and the place that we do this work. Right. Like I think the the issues that we're interrogating stretch beyond just the recording in the show. But we really try to call out structural imbalances in our lives, at NPR, in podcasting, and in hip-hop with this show. And it's very difficult work. It's very draining and demanding work. But I think we were very supportive to each other throughout that. And I'm, I'm just really inspired and proud of everybody for remaining committed to that and empowering through it. You said, like, commitment, Gabby. And, I, and I'm thinking about, like, how we were so committed also to telling the stories exactly how we wanted to tell them and uh, I think there was a version of this podcast that would have maybe been more generous to the artists and easier um, and maybe even given us more access to, to artists that we didn't see on this on this season going into the models of uh, more traditional hip-hop media right now which is all about access and all about you know doing favors and all about basically at its worst PR. Um, Mm -hmm. And instead of that, we actually said what we wanted to say. We ruffled feathers with some of these episodes, uh, visibly and behind the scenes. I Um, know, that's right. Yeah, uh, (laughs) we we don't have to talk about that, but... uh, uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, But, and I think it's really inspiring that we challenge each other on that front uh, in these meetings, writing these episodes. And it also kind of makes me feel a little sad because I'm not sure when the next time I'll be in a position where I can tell stories exactly this way um, with this level of resources and uh, at the same time challenging the structures that be. Yeah, I feel that really deeply. The way that we told stories wasn't about showing just the good side of any experience or just the good side of anyone's artistry, but showing like the full nuance of what each story held. And I think by doing that, we're allowing for a world to exist where people just give each other more care because we're all just like kind of dealing with <laughs> these systems of power that are like over all of us. And being able to be honest about that allows us to show up more fully for each other. And that's just so rare. And I wish that there was more space and more time committed by the people that are funding this kind of work to allow for that to exist. I think what we really accomplished this season was showing that 
that complexity, how you're saying, Sam, we show so much more of the multitudes of these situations that normally get deduced to trending topics or hot takes or fleeting headlines. That's how this culture gets flattened. When it just becomes all the good stuff, i.e. the PR, the, the profiles, the shiny, glossy cover shoot, the artists talking to artists, the, the fluff, and I don't believe there is not an audience appetite for this. I think it's more about who's in the driver's seat when it comes to the coin, when it comes to really investing and investing long term to build a community, to build audience on a consistent level. And I would like to see more of the people who hold the purse strings be down for the long haul too. And I think if there was just more ownership and agency from Jump about the intention of the work, that could really shift the paradigm. We know that people are interested in it. We know that hip hop fans want to interrogate the culture, want to challenge it to be better. Um, We know that hip hop fans are truth seekers. We know that hip hop deserves this kind of attention, but also this kind of dissection interrogation. It deserves Mm -hmm. that and care care. Um, and the patience and drive to get it right is really missing right now. I've been really committed to doing this type of work. Every show that I've worked on has ended up canceled. And so I think being dealt this latest blow is especially hard to stomach because it felt like not only was it a show about hip hop, but it was a show that was unapologetically committed to getting it right. And yeah, I'm just really mourning that loss. I think the thing about scarcity is that when resources are scarce, people tend to also limit their imaginations. And if you're operating from a place of scarcity out of fear, you're you're just going to keep recreating that same thing over and over again. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like the same kind of conversation that we have when we talk about abolition or when we talk about building a more equitable world, right? Like people get stuck on like reform. And it's like, what if we actually imagined, you know, something different? (laughs) What if we stopped trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? Bringing it back to our team, like we came into this with so much imagination. We spent so much time imagining what the season could look like. And then we took a hard look at our resources and we took a hard look at our time and we made some decisions about what was actually possible. But it was built out of a place of abundance. It was built out of a place where every single person on this team got to contribute ideas, got to bring in what they wanted to work on and got to bring their voice to it. Yeah. And I think like that's what made the season what it is, is coming from that place instead of a place of like, oh, we only get to do this one thing or we only get to feature this one story. The results of that to me are something that I'm really proud of. On that note, can we can we just spill to the people some of the other stories that, you know, we we did work on or we tried to get to and because of time and space and bandwidth and, and Mano, to your point, access, uh, we couldn't all the way execute, but that we're still percolating on. Does anyone have one of, that they would want to share? Yeah, I mean, we spent a really good amount of time with Flo Millie, um, who was a delight. I want women to be strong. I want them to know, like, you can't have this confidence about yourself, or if you don't, like, here's something it's like a gym like you know that I want to show women like this is my persona this is my attitude and you could feel like that too oh my gosh there is some tape that we don't use Yo. for the Rico Nasty episode which is Sid and <laughs> Gabby oh my gosh. following Rico around in the rain oh my at Rosley City in the back that of the day. Day. Yes. that's so just so good, so yeah. good. <laughs> It's it so was her good. 25th birthday. That was, oh my God. Yo, that was crazy. They brought her a cake on stage and she ate it with her bare hands. When I scooped the fucking cake up, I was like, <laughs> Rico. <laughs> no, I, the nails. That was such an intrusive thing to <laughs> do. Really like, was. I didn't even mean to do it. My brain she was like, do it. I was like, when, okay. when the dude passed by us with the cake, I was like, look at the damage. Look, we're like, why did she do that? I'm glad you didn't do that. Today. And then you're so, trying to yeah. hold the mic and still sing it with this hand, all this icing. Oh my <laughs> god. Like, yeah. We tried for a few people who uh who really wanted 
to be compensated in some ways we who wanted to be paid um or wanted to have some type of Yo, how expose is this no, third? I was gonna thing? say, like, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we have to go there. All of our dirty laundry. There. There's a director's cut mm-hmm. somewhere of the body policing episode. There's so much amazing stuff on the cutting room floor oh, of that episode. We talked the to the, yeah the dancers from Dochi's music video. We were all different body types. All these beautiful black women were being represented in all phases and all shapes and sizes it made me happy because i was like yes everyone be free be naked (laughs) i felt very confident doing this as a woman completely naked i just felt very free as well like i could really do movement like this and not feel like this is to please the male eye or any eye for that matter I mean, and, and another one, like, in that vein, Sid, is that for our episode that features Kim Osorio, there were Kim herself, but also multiple sources mm-hmm. that just did not feel comfortable being on record. And that's, yep. you know, I think that's the episode that I think so much about and that if I ever get a chance to revisit that exact episode again some later time, I probably would. Because it's a real indictment of where we still stand in terms of alleged sexual harassment and abuse Mm -hmm. and just how much society and the legal system uh, really makes it challenging for people to speak up or honestly impossible for them to speak up. Yeah. I really wish um, we could have had more space and it could have been a separate episode to have a meditation about deep-seated colorism and the social capital that's placed on looking racially ambiguous in a black ass art form related to that there could have been great storytelling we could have done if we had time and space dissecting the inherent fat phobia that exists in this culture something that we did in almost every single interview and we did over 60 i think for this season was we asked almost everyone we spoke to to imagine a future of hip hop that was more equitable and to close their eyes and just for a second, just like dream with us. And we always got back the most amazing answers. And I think we had always talked about doing some sort of visions of black hip hop mm-hmm. futurity, crazy ambi dreamscape moment that we're going to put them all together. And you know, we just kind of ran out of time, but maybe you'll hear that right now. What does the future look and feel and sound like what's your dream for the future of hip-hop what do you want to see what do you want the future from, from hip-hop, hip-hop to sound for like women in the future what comes to mind i am the future <laughs> massage noir doesn't exist community it's about caring and sharing each one teach one i want for younger women to be safe i want them to be able to be imaginative Gay as fuck. The gays and the girls. The gays and the girls. <laughs> we see a lot of non-binary and transgender people becoming the face of a genre, like killing it. That is the direction that we're going. Definitely more female, definitely more feminist, definitely more black, and just with the vibes. Confidence, boldness, fierceness more owning of who we are. Several labels that are owned by women, more women breaking the standard. Charts is fold up with females. That's what I'm waiting for. More accepted and moving to the forefront. We're just rewriting everything, like being there for each other. I think we're headed in a good path. Making space for the plethora of women rappers who have a lot to say. We're really going to have to put some power behind our words, right? If we really want this, we're going to have to start divesting from artists that do harm. I'm not saying everything, but I'm saying everything. No boys on. We can we can be limitless. They owe us everything we deserve. Now it's time for our voices to be heard. Do you do you see it coming soon? Do I see it coming soon? Definitely. I hope, honestly, that everybody listening, especially cats like me who may have been learning along the way, really get a lot out of this because 
whether it's is is hip hop or the culture, quote unquote, or, or or what have you, we just we got some growing to do, and that's okay. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like the thing that this culture and this genre were founded on was about us breaking through the doors, breaking down barriers, and giving a voice to to the unheard. And if we ain't still doing that now, I don't know if it can be rightly called hip hop. But the truth is, hip hop, in a lot of ways, is kind of one of the powers that be now. It is. You know, and so Mm -hmm. now a lot of the kind of um, rigorous journalism that we're talking about doesn't necessarily really serve the industry in the ways that it might have served you know, the culture and the people, you know, consuming hip hop all throughout, you know, um, where we are now, if you don't serve the machine, if you ain't feeding the machine or helping to churn the machine, um, the machine is trying to eat you up, you know, and that's what's happened to us. And I think that's what's happening to a lot of music journalism. And I hope that all of us in our own individual, not hope, I know, and our own individual, you know, paths that we take from here are going to continue to do that, be it in the world of journalism or in the, you know, motherfucking real world. You know what I'm saying? So um, that I'm not worried about. And and, and that just means we're going to reproduce more of the same and, and affect more of the same, which is hopefully real change, you know. So that's all I got. All right, y'all. This is it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for rocking with us all these seasons, talking back to us on Twitter, and supporting us every step of the way. I'm Cindy Madden. I'm Gabby Bulgarelli. I'm Sam J. Leeds. I'm Mono Sundarason. I'm Soraya Shockley. I'm Rodney Carmichael. And this right here, this team right here, it's louder than a rat. Louder Than a Riot is hosted by me, Cindy Madden, and Ronnie Carmichael. This episode was written by the entire team, and it was produced by Gabby Bulgarelli, Mano Sandra Asen, Sam J. Leeds, and Raina Cohen. Louder senior producer is Gabby Bulgarelli. Our producers are Sam J. Leeds and Mano Sandra Asen, with help from Raina Cohen. Our editor is Soraya Shockley. Our engineer for this episode is Josh Newell. And shout out to Gilly Moon, who handled engineering every other episode with tender love and audio care. Our senior supervisor and producer is Cher Vincent. Our project managers are Margaret Price and Lindsay McKenna. Our interns are Jose Sandoval, Teresa Shia, and Pilar Galvan. And the NPR execs are Keith Jenkins, Yolanda Sangueni, and Anya Grunman. Original theme by Casa Overall. Remix by Susie Analog. And the scoring for this episode was provided by Susie Analog and Casa Overall. Our digital editors are Jacob Gans, Sheldon Pierce, and Dawood Tyler Amin. Our visual and social team is Alante Serene, Ashley Pointer, Jackie Lay, Otis Hart, Iman Young, and Matt Adams. Peace out, bruh. Our fact checker for this episode is Bryn Winterbottom. And shout out to the whole team over at RAD who held us down all season with some impeccable fact checking. Thank you to Ashley Messenger, our bomb ass lawyer. Thank you to our season one crew. And thank you to all the ATL member stations we taped at WABE and GPB. We appreciate you for talking to us back on Twitter and emailing us at louder at npr.org. Check the Twitter if you want to see more BTS of this season and find out where you can follow everybody. And to all our loved ones who supported us while we struggle and strive through making this season, this series, from scraps, from nothing, from the bottom, thank you the most. We love you for real. From NPR Music, I'm Rodney Carmichael. And I'm Sydney Madden. And And this this is Louder Than than a Riot. Riot. Are you a huge Louder fan? 
What if I told you you could buy your very own louder soundboard, complete with classic louder sounds like meow and meow and of course meow meow meow. You should keep them little noises in there too. Oh my god. Louder's S2 soundboard is out now. Visit the NPR store and use code LOUDER to get yours. Let's go. Bow. Bow.